Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today I wanted to talk about plant vascular system. Now at least for me, one of the most distinguishing defining features of plants is their ability to do photosynthesis. Plants, as you know, are autotrophs. They take carbon dioxide from the ambient air and water from the ground and with the help of light and chlorophyll produce sugar. Now the question is, how does the water from the ground and the minerals from the ground go to all different parts of the tree? And we know this happens. You might have done this experiment before. So you can put some water in some jars and put some coloring in there and put some stems with flowers on them like this. And you will see the flowers will change color. They will take up the color of the water that they are in. All of these flowers had started out as white. But the one in the blue jar became blue, the one in the red jar became red, and the stem that was teased into two with one leg in each jar took the color of both of the jars. So we can easily demonstrate that the water goes from down there all the way up to the very ends of the plant. How does this happen? Now, if you had said capillary action, that would be actually a pretty good answer. See, capillary action is like the climbing of the water on the walls of the plant in little tiny capillaries like straws. See, capillary action is the climbing of water along the walls of these capillaries or straws that go all the way from the bottom to the top of the plant. But that's not the entire answer. The reason that's not the entire answer is that capillary action can take the water only up so far. So if you were to take a straw and you can do this experiment at home and put it in a glass of water the water will climb up the straw. See, the water will only climb up so high because the air, now air is full of all kinds of molecules, is pushing on the water. In fact, the skinnier the straw, the higher the water will climb. So, if capillary action was responsible for taking the water from the ground and the minerals from the ground all the way up to the tips of the plant, that's really not going to be it because that's not going to be sufficient except for tiny little plants. So, what do plants do? A slight modification of the same process, see, is what the plants do. Now imagine this. What if the water molecule could escape from the top like this? Then you can see the water will be basically sucked up from the ground continuously. This process is demonstrated in this little experiment over here. Now as you can see in this time-lapse picture, the water continues to flow from one cup to the other cup. And the reason this happens is because the water is being continuously emptied in the other cup. So the process that you see before you here is capillary action. But if you take capillary action and combine it with evaporation of water from the leaves, then you get transpiration. And that's how water and minerals are being basically sucked out from the ground and to different parts of the tree. Now let's look at this process in a little bit more detail. Now water enters the roots from the ground and basically drags the mineral with it. And then the water climbs up the tree via the capillary action. And the properties of the water molecules, its adhesive property and its cohesive property because it's a polar molecule, is what allows water to climb up the tree in these tiny little capillaries called the xylem. And then in the very periphery of the plant, the water evaporates to a special pores called stomata or from the leaves in general. And this process allows water and minerals basically be sucked out of the ground and distributed to all different parts of the tree. Now this process, known as transpiration, also helps to keep the plant cool and regulate its temperature. Thus, it is the process of transpiration which allows water and minerals to come from the ground and be distributed to all different parts of the tree. So water and minerals travel to the tree in these highways, so to speak. And once the plant carries out for its synthesis, it uses the energy that it produces for its functions. And also, if you recall, it produces sugar as a stored form of energy. These sugar molecules, they're stored in different parts of the plant. They're stored in the roots, they're stored in the stem of the tree, etc. So the sugar has to be distributed also from all the areas where it is produced to different parts of the plant. And it is this highway system that constitutes the circulatory system of the plant. The highway system that transports water and minerals from the ground and from the roots all the way to different parts of the tree. That is the xylem. 
and the highway system that transports the sugar and amino acids, etc., from leaves to different storage sites. That's called the phloem. Now, I remember xylem as taking water mills from the ground towards the sky because xylem has this kind of like sky sound to it. Xylem, skylem. And phloem is the transport system that takes sugars, etc., from the leaves to different parts where it's needed. Xylem and phloem together constitute the vascular system of the plant. If you were to take a cross section of a stem, this is how it would look. As you can see, the die cut stem and the monocut stem look different. Now, these colorful things that you see in this diagram are the phloem and the xylem that's being illustrated. So, phloem and the xylem are the vascular bundles of the plant. In other words, that's where the traffic is, that's where the water, minerals, and glucose, etc., is being moved from one area to another area. And how they're arranged is different in dicot plants and in monocot plants. In this monocot stem, for example, the vascular bundles, as you can see, are scattered. They're not organized in a particular fashion. But each vascular bundle is distinct. If you look at these individual vascular bundles, each of them will contain xylem elements. These are the water and mineral transporting systems. And each of them will contain the phloem elements, which carry sugar, amino acids, etc. In a die-cut stem, as I stated, these bundles are more organized in the way they are arranged. But nevertheless, each bundle is very similar in its anatomy. The phloem elements are on the outside, and the xylem elements are on the inside. Now, you understand these are cross-sections, and each of those dots basically represents a straw that goes from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant. In between the phloem and the xylem elements, you see this red layer, and this is the cambrium the vascular cambrium. Now these are progenitor cells. In other words, these are the cells that give rise to the phloem elements and give rise to the xylem elements. Another way of saying that is the xylem and phloem come from the vascular cambrium. The vascular cambrium is called meristematic tissue or embryonic cells that have the capacity to develop into either phloem or xylem cells. Now here's another look of a dicot stem. As you can see, in each vascular element, again, the phloem is on the outside or in the periphery, the xylem elements are on the inside. If you look at the area in higher magnification, at least for me, you'll see something quite amazing. On the left are the xylem elements, on the right side of the screen are the phloem elements, and sandwiched in between is the cambrium. Now, as you recall, water and minerals use xylem for transport and sugars and amino acids, etc., use the phloem for transport. One thing that we must understand, that in the xylem, the traffic is only one directional. In other words, water goes from the ground to different parts of the tree like this. So the traffic is always unidirectional. Whereas in the phloem, in fact, the traffic can go either way. Because the glucose is transported from the leaves to different parts of the tree to wherever it's needed. And the second very important aspect of the phloem is that it requires energy. Transport of water and minerals does not require energy, but transport of sugar, amino acids, etc. is an energy requiring process. Now, if you look at the xylem elements in detail, this is what you will see. The term xylem does not refer to one thing. It refers to different structures that are part of this transport system. The two most important types of transport systems are called trachid and vessel elements. These are basically straws. Now, as you also know, straws come in different sizes and shapes. The skinny straws in xylem are called the trachids. The vessel elements, in fact, are more efficacious in the transport of water and minerals. See, what a trachid is are cells connected to one another like this, and in the areas of connection, there are little tiny holes called pits, so that one cell is connected to another cell, and another cell is connected to another cell, etc., forming a very long straw. Now, these cells, in fact, they're not alive. What they are, in fact, are ghosts of cells, and what they basically are are ghosts of dead cells, the skeleton of the cell wall that remains with everything inside being gone. On the contrary, cells that make up phloem are not dead cells, they're not ghosts of cells, they're living cells, very active and very alive indeed. Now, if you were to look at the phloem structure in detail, you see cells attached to cells like this, and between each cell is what's called a sieve plate. 
each of these individual cells is called a sieve cell, and in between these cells is a plate called a sieve plate. The sieve plate is a porous membrane which allows materials to go from one cell to another cell, basically like windows between cells. Now curiously, these sieve cells don't have nuclei. They have cytoplasm, but they're also devoid of much of the other elements of a normal cell. And if it weren't for their best buddy companion cells, they would be in trouble. Now you will see that each of these sieve cells is associated with the best buddy, best friend cell called the companion cells. Now the companion cells are basically the support and the brains of these sieve cells. Now as I said, the sieve cells themselves do not have a nuclei. Another cartoon representation, the same, is on the left. As you can see, the sieve plate between sieve cells and the companion cells basically hugging these sieve cells and sides in support of them. Now the companion cells just don't only support the sieve cells, they are in fact very important in transport of sugars, etc. So let's say you want to transport sugar from over here, which is a cell, let's say, in a leaf where photosynthesis occurred and you see all this chloroplast over there. It is the companion cell that regulates that flow of sugar. The companion cell takes the sugar from the source and by a process that requires energy, places them in the phloem tubules, the sieve cells. And then the sugar then flows to where it's needed. In this case, it is the root cell. Now where the sugar is coming from, that's called the source of the sugar. And where it's going is called the sink. Sugar in the form of sucrose is delivered to where it's needed in the sink by the help of the companion cells. Now this process again requires energy. Now an interesting phenomenon occurs. As sugar enters the phloem over here, because of osmotic pressure, water moves from the xylem and into the phloem. This increases the water pressure in the phloem and basically pushes the sugar down to where it's needed. This process, the movement of sugar from one area of the plant to a different area of the plant, is called translocation. Now let's review before we finish. This is a model of a stem. As you can see, the very big elements over here, that's the xylem elements. These are hollow ghost cell or cell walls of dead cells for transporting water and minerals. On the outside, you'll find the phloem elements. These are living cells for food or sap transport. And the traffic here is bidirectional, whereas traffic in xylem, as you recall, is in one way or unidirectional. Now that concludes our brief survey of the vascular system of plants. Next time, inshallah, we shall build on this. Until then, as-salatu wa salam wa sallallahu wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum.